Hello, everyone. This is another episode of Unisoft Law YouTube show where I bring really interesting people to you, mostly lawyers. And today we have a special guest from Ottawa, a commercial litigator with a fascinating history. Her name is uh, Alyssa Tompkins. I think she's the best per person to talk about herself. So I will just let her tell you about herself. Hello, Alyssa. Hello, Pula. Thanks so much for having me on your on your YouTube. Uh, my name is Alyssa Tompkins. I born and raised in Ottawa. I left Ottawa briefly, went to Queens for my undergraduate degree, ended up being two degrees, started in engineering chemistry, finished it, but along the way also did a degree in political studies. Engineering was a lot of math. <laughs> Uh, after law school, I worked for a year on Parliament Hill as an intern for the House Finance Committee. After that, I went to law school at University of Ottawa Common Law, uh, then clerked for Justice Bastrash at the Supreme Court of Canada, went with him to Heenan Blakey, became his first junior there, uh, then was at Heenan for three and a half years and left Heenan uh, to form my current firm, which is a litigation boutique in Ottawa called Casa Safely. Interesting. And I noticed, I, I looked at your firm's website uh, before our interview, and I noticed that uh, Justice uh, Bastarash is actually counsel to your firm right now. <laughs> Correct. I got him back. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Yeah. I always wondered what it's like to have a uh, former uh, Supreme Court judge uh, in your firm. Uh, do you have to go through metal detectors to talk to him or something like that? <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Uh, they very quickly lose that status. But it's more, uh, it's fascinating when you're working on cases to be able to get even though it's not legally relevant, the subjective intent of the drafter, but to still get his perspective on where he was coming from when drafting some of his decisions. And then obviously just he can review our appellate materials and provide that perspective of how a judge's first instinct. And you said that you co-founded your firm, correct? Yes, though I, I will note at the time I was an associate, I was in a partner, so I, I don't know if that truly makes me a founder, but I was one of the five original members. We all left Tain and Blakey in January 2012, and four of us are still there and are the current partners of the firm. So well, perhaps you were employee number one, like in a startup. Correct. It was very much a startup mentality. Uh, being the, the one person with a technical degree, you know, I set up the Wi-Fi network in the firm. I remember crawling around on the floor, hooking up the router. And, you know, the, the few days prior, I had, I had gone to the Toronto office of Heenan and it was so beautiful at Bay Adelaide Center, you know, and I just remember thinking, oh my goodness, what have I done? <laughs> but it all worked out. I looked at your website and uh, you have, I think, almost 10 lawyers now, right, in that firm? Uh, at least, I, well, we actually just hired two, so we might be up to 12. And then our council ranks are, are extremely high for a boutique. <laughs> our two, we, have, we have two fantastic senior counsel who are two of my most important mentors, Justice Bastrash that I mentioned, and also Ivan Whitehall who used to be the chief general counsel at the Department of Justice. So I've been argued more than 40 cases at the Supreme Court. So we're, I think we're over counseled. <laughs> uh, did you say you argued over 40 no, cases? No, Ivan. My oh, mentor. Ivan, I'm sorry. Yes. No, I've <laughs> argued twice. <laughs> You've argued twice. Well, that's more than I. I argued zero. <laughs> okay. But, but then I, I never was uh, a clerk at the Supreme Court. In that respect, um, I'm really curious about that experience. I remember when I was in Ottawa, just as a tourist. Um, yes, people go to Ottawa from Toronto as tourists. <laughs> they so, should. <laughs> I stopped. I stopped by the Supreme Court of Canada, and I was uh, I was a student at Osgood at the time, so it was many years ago. And uh, I caught up with a hearing and the hearing was just wrapping up. And uh, I think the clerks were sitting in a gallery somewhere to the side or something like that. And then I yelled at, at them and I said, is anybody from Osgood here? 
<laughs> so they actually grabbed someone from Osgood and we went out, we had coffee, you know, and we chatted, it was a lot of fun. And uh, she told me about um, uh, working there. Do you think there is such a thing as blue blood in law and in law practice? I, I do, I do. I just, I'm not someone that has it. Um, you know, well, my, I don't, I'm a quote, first generation lawyer. So I, I do think that there are, if, if that's what you're referring to, that there are some people who come to the profession with a, a great deal of knowledge and understanding. And it's in part because they have family uh, parents often who are already in the law. Well, my blue blood uh, reference was more merit based than uh, actual blood based. So, oh, for okay. example, yeah. So, for example, I know that it's it's uh, it's a reference for uh, traditionally for royalty, you know, and people with some uh, noble roots. But uh, in this respect, in uh, in the context of the legal profession. I'm wondering about hierarchies in the legal profession, right? And uh, it's, it's really all about hierarchy sometimes. And uh, do you think that belonging to this select group, people who clerked at the Supreme Court of Canada um, puts you in a certain tier, uh, whether it involves more responsibilities than privileges is also possible, right? Um, we can talk about that, but do you think uh, it's one of the markers of, of, of the legal blue blood clerking at the Supreme Court of Canada? It's certainly, I think, become that way. I'm not sure it was always the case in Canada, but my understanding is we, we've sort of followed the US tradition, tradition that it became something to do. Like I had ranked first in my class in first year law school and the school approached me and said, this is what you should be doing. Uh, applying to clerk the Supreme Court. So it, I was very much pushed in that direction. Uh, I was always told that after you clerk, you have five years to sort of ride on that reputation. But after that, people are gonna start looking at what have you done lately? What have you done with that? I think from my own perspective, when I got to Heenan Blakey, I was given opportunities on big files very early including uh, not only in the Ottawa office, but in the Toronto office. But then it became a question of making the most of those opportunities. And I, I, you know, I've seen other people who are clerks who can never put it together as a practitioner. Uh, a number of clerks, it, it, you know, the practical aspects of private practice, of which I'm sure you're aware, that it, it's a different skill set than, <laughs> than, than clerking. Where, which can be a bit more academic in nature. But uh, yeah, I was always told I had five years to make it or nobody would care anymore about my clerkship. Uh, interesting. What is the clerking skill set? Well, our firm actually hires a lot of former clerks. It's something that we look for. So the reason that we look for that, I would say, is that you get thrown cases in all different areas of the law and you have to figure it out very quickly. So our firm, I wouldn't say we're generalists, but we have a broad practice area and we encourage our lawyers to work in different areas. Uh, I think clerking teaches you to break things down to first principles, to sort of understand why the law is the way it is, which helps not only with appeals, it's more obvious on appeals, but often at first instance as well. So I think what clerking, does is it it demonstrates a facility to learn areas of the law quickly that to me is the most important thing obviously research and writing as well but particularly what our firm values in former clerks is is that ability to jump into new areas i loved your first principles reference this ability to go to the roots of an issue and understand why things the way they are do you think the clerking experience uh, shares this approach with science and technology? Isn't this also uh, what is expected of a scientist or an engineer to understand deeply how something works on the first principles level? 
And I'm asking, yeah. of course, because your BA is in engineering chemistry. <laughs> right. So interestingly, that is true about science, less so about engineering. So science, of course, I mean, that's, that's how they teach it. They spend a long time deriving a formula and then you apply the formula in the lab. What I found really interesting in engineering, particularly like third year or so, the hardcore engineering courses, mass transfer, heat transfer, they're often empirically uh, derived equations, which means that somebody has done, you know, thousands of experiments and they basically create a line of best fit and create a crazy equation. You know, it's got all kinds of fractions and this and that, and then you apply it and it works, but it, it's not as simplistic as, as we would expect from pure science, you know, where the equations are often shockingly simple for how complicated the concept can be. So when you say that engineers, if I understood you correctly, merely apply uh, equations uh, derived by scientists, uh, doesn't it, doesn't it uh, sound a little bit like lawyers merely applying precedents prepared by other lawyers who probably understood first principles better than those applying those precedents? Yeah, I mean, it's an oversimplification, simplification, obviously. It was just something that surprised me. But no, I mean, I, I don't think just working from precedents is a, is a very intelligent way to work. Um, it's certainly not the way I proceed. So like, I'm not someone who always uses a previous statement of claim. You know, you'll, you'll look at it to make sure you don't forget something, but it's a more effective pleading starts from your own case and you actually set out the, the facts. Well, first you figure out the causes of action that you want to plead, which actually can take quite a while. What are the elements of those causes of action? And then what are the facts and support, that's almost like a spreadsheet analysis though. And then I think what law adds that's sometimes missing from law and engineering, there's an artistry to it too though, is that you still, even in a pleading, you need to make sure you hit the elements, but ideally it will tell a story as well. This is great. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically, for a lawyer to be a good lawyer, not a great lawyer, but a good lawyer, it's enough to cover all bases, to go through the checklist, not to miss a fact, not to miss an essential fact, not to miss a, uh, an element of a cause, uh, a cause of an action, uh, you know, not to miss a deadline. Basically, don't <laughs> miss things and um, uh, go through the checklist. But then if you want to go to the next level, if you want to be a great lawyer, then you will also engage the uh, adjudicator's soul, sort mm -hmm. of, right? And, and what, is this what you mean by, you know, uh, go through the checklist, but then also tell a story? Exactly. That, I mean, that's what takes, you have to have all the building blocks, but then the advocacy part is the persuasion. And you're, whether you call it your soul, your, but that's where you want to convince the decision maker. And yes, a pleading you first and foremost, you need to make sure you hit all of those building blocks, but it is the first thing a judge often reads the pleading. So you don't want to miss even starting as early as your, your statement of claim. You don't want to miss an opportunity to tell, tell a story. You just have to make sure that that story includes all of the building blocks that you need. The other the other aspect of it that's, I think, a little less technical is, is when you're figuring out the cause of action, sometimes that's not obvious. I mean, it's, it's, I'm sure you've had the same experience that a client comes to you and something's happened and it's bad, but it's not always obvious immediately what's the cause of action. And even when you sometimes think it's one, there might be a better cause of action that gets you a better remedy or perhaps doesn't have defenses that one might. So you do wanna choose the best cause of action to get the result that you want in the end. Or there is a cause of action where the judge has less discretion and uh, you don't have to worry about this mysterious justice of the case thing as much, uh, which uh, sometimes um, really puzzles me. But I think this is really part, part of the art 
uh, don't you think? Um, being able to uh, get the justice of the case in cases that call for it. Uh, yes, sometimes there are formulas in law tests, but often enough, especially in interlocutory uh, proceedings, it's discretionary decisions, right, that, that matter uh, or decisions that apply so-called justice of the case. How do you cope with, uh, with those situations where uh, the predict predictability, I mean, assuming the facts are, are not obviously on your side. So it's really about getting the judge to exercise their discretion in your client's favor and uh, convincing the judge that the justice of the case is on your client's side. How do you cope with the situations like that? Well, I mean, that's, it's a huge part of the job of being a litigator. Ron Kaza, who I work with, has, he has the remarkable ability to always claim the moral high ground. I've never seen him in a case where he truly didn't believe that he had the moral high ground. So that's really one of his strengths is he finds uh, the gros bon sens, the common sense reason why our client should prevail. And when I work with him, often my job is to find the law to support that and develop and present it in a way that's palatable. But one of the things I've taken from Ron is the critical importance of convincing the judge that not only is it technically correct, unlikely to be reversed, but that they're doing the right thing. So you can often find a way and, you know, I'm doing an appeal right now on a limitations issue. And, you know, that's a, a very difficult place to be. I'm on for a, def a bunch of defendants and there's always a sympathy factor to the plaintiffs there. So you kind of have to claim a different moral high ground. Sometimes it's judicial policy with respect to limitations, obviously the statute of repose, the importance of finality. Like you have to try to always though find that, that justification for why the court should rule in your favor. And it, it can't just be solely the application of a test. What uh, moral high ground did you claim in the Vavilov case when you uh, argued on behalf of the Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic? Well, my associate actually argued that I was I was there, but I, I let him plead it actually because he had found he had found the client and and done more of the work. Well, in that case, we were we were arguing for less deference and it was actually fascinating at that hearing because and I I think the court was taken aback that over time there had been a, a view that access to justice was in, equated with deference. And actually one of the fascinating things that happened at that hearing is that all of the organizations that acted for individuals, be it, uh, be it refugees or immigrants uh, like Mr. Vavilov, or in our case, we were acting basically on behalf of individuals against large telecommunications companies or the state uh, that those parties were all seeking less deference. And I think the court hadn't, hadn't expected that because in the past, I think it was kind of an easy assumption that you know administrative tribunals are cheaper and faster, therefore they promote access to justice. But all these organizations were finding that the justice they get is unsatisfactory and that large companies and the government were dominating at these tribunals. So in fact, all, a lot of the organizations, I remember the, the Queen's pr Prison Clinic was there, prisoners, another one, everybody was saying less, less deference that uh, basically these people want justice. It's, they are not accessing the system and getting spit out. They actually wanna feel that their cases have been evaluated and that the result is fair. Uh, Est-ce que tout le monde dans votre bureau parle français? De fait, oui. Oui, nous avons, je pense, un parajuris qui est, qui est moins bon à s'exprimer, mais il peut le comprendre. 
Don't I we? love this. I love this. I, I don't want anyone to forget that we are in Canada, we are Canadian, and that uh, French is a big part of our tradition and legal system. And when I looked at your firm's website, I saw how uh, important for French or francophone, the francophone side of our law is to your firm. Uh, do you do a lot of cases uh, in, uh, in French? I do, I do. So uh, not as many as some of my other francophone colleagues, but I would say I'm currently a bit low, maybe 20% in French, but I've been very high. I mean, Ron Caza and I acted in a huge hearing for the Quebec Chicken Marketing Board, Les Alvaux de Valais de Quebec, in a hearing that was uh, over a year in Quebec before the Régie des Marches Agricoles. So basically, for a year of my life, I, I spent in Quebec in a completely French proceeding. I've pleaded in French at the Federal Court of Appeal, uh, Superior Court. So it it is an, a very important thing at our firm, and it's something that uh, Justice Bastrash was the first to really push on me, but I'm a complete convert, and I, I think we have a bilingual legal system. So mm -hmm. I find my ability to read jurisprudence, for example, from Quebec, like bef just before this call, I'm doing an oppression file in Ontario, but I'm reading Quebec cases in French because there, they have the same legislation. Uh, the CBCA applies there too. So, you know, there's a whole wealth of jurisprudence that I think unilingual Anglophones miss out on. Yes, this is exactly what uh, we talked about uh, in another interview on this, uh, on this YouTube show with, with a friend of mine uh, who is uh, from Quebec, but she's called in Ontario and uh, she crosses the river she still lives in quebec but she crosses the river because she works at the legal clinic near ottawa and she crosses the river every day to go to work and uh, we talked about uh, how english-speaking lawyers miss out on a big part of our legal tradition and legal uh, authority so here is a question for you in this respect have you ever had a chance to cite uh, 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 any legal authority in French before an Anglophone or English speaking judge in an English speaking proceeding? Yes, for sure. I, wow. uh, I, last year at the BC Court of Appeal, I cited a Quebec decision. So I basically uh, translated on the fly for the court. <laughs> wow, that's, that's so, incredible. Yeah, that's inc incredible. So, uh, and did you ever did you ever have to do anything uh, the other way around, citing an English authority for a French speaking judge or adjudicator? No, every adjudicator I have appeared in front of who is francophone claims to understand English. I it's okay. not my place to assess whether that's accurate or not. Certainly, uh, it's the same way. Some Anglophones who say they're bilingual were skeptical. I have the same issue with some of the adjudicators I've appeared in front of who claim to understand English, but based on the questions, it doesn't appear they do. But it's, it's obviously very risky for a lawyer to suggest that the adjudicator doesn't know their own language skills. So in those cases, we'll provide often like a complimentary translation or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, how many jurisdictions have, are you called to bar at? Uh, interesting question. I am currently only called in Ontario, but I am in the process of being called in Yukon. Oh, why, why Yukon? I have a case there. Oh, I see. And you have to be called to uh, act in Yukon, right? Correct. Yeah, they, they won't even let you. Well, they won't let me provide legal advice, but definitely let alone provide legal advice, but I can't go on the record either. So I'm co-counseling with a friend who is a Yukon lawyer, but we want to have me on the record as well. So I am actually in the process. I'm just getting some reference letters to confirm that I'm a respectable lawyer in Ontario. And then I hope to be called very shortly in Yukon. But I've, I've had a um, temp, I've been 
approved to practice on a temporary basis in Quebec for the, mm -hmm. some of those agricultural files I was mentioning, but otherwise you can, you know, you can largely practice around the country um, with the except, you always have to check first. Yukon was when I checked and was like, whoa, uh, you actually do need to be called here, but I had no problem appearing in, in British Columbia, in Alberta, uh, New Brunswick, we have a case right now. Mm -hmm. Quebec's the mm -hmm. tricky one. Wow, interesting. Do you speak any other languages besides English and French? No, I, I really want to learn Spanish. My sister-in-law is Mexican, but uh, I haven't got around to it yet. Well, I hear that once you speak French, uh, if you start learning Spanish, you get confused quickly because there are so many similarities. And I actually <laughs> tested that it's true when, when I did, <laughs> when I tried learning Spanish. Uh, I found the best way to learn Spanish is to go to Spain or, or a Latin American country. I guess mm -hmm. that, that, that's true for all languages. Uh, great. So you worked on uh, uh, the Vavilov case in the Supreme Court of Canada, and that was a pro bono engagement, I understand, right? Correct. Yes. So uh, what was the other Supreme Court of Canada case that you argued? Oh, I did two more also pro bono. They're all interventions so far. Uh, so I did the Vavilov one. Uh, and as I said, I let my associate argue it. The other two I argued, uh, one for the Canadian American Bar Association, and that was the Uber, the Uber and right. Heller decision. And then the other one I did was for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. And that was a case involving the application of Section 12 of the Charter, the Freedom from Cruel and Unusual Punishment to corporations. Wow. I, I can't quickly figure out what the connection is, but I will ask you about that uh, in a second. What position did your client take in the Uber case? So the Canadian American Bar Association, uh, it, it's a very broad organization. So it represents people from both sides of the class action debate. So our mm -hmm. position was not really related to the class action or the unconscionability side. It just dealt with the arbitration aspect. And it was a very technical arbitration point, the competence competence principle, and basically who should be determining it, the arbitrator or the court. And, and we said the arbitrator should be doing more and that the the court's analysis should be uh, extremely limited. Mm -hmm. and, and tell me about the uh, application of the prohibition against uh, cruel and, and unusual punishments uh, 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 in, in, regard of, in regard to corporations. Tell me about that case. Right, so the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, and, and it was a, a very interesting mandate because Typically, the CCLA takes a very large and liberal view towards the charter. But mm -hmm. here they were saying not quite so large to oh. include protecting corporations. And the reason for that is that it, it can start to undermine the rights that are provided to humans if they're applied to corporations in the same way. And the, the corporations can begin to actually dominate the rights discourse. So we took the position that that Section 12 in particular uh, should not apply to corporations and that the origin of the rule, it, it really flows from the freedom, from torture, from the death penalty, and that it, it was really getting at uh, the human, a human element. So that extending it to corporations uh, is not in keeping with with the purpose of that right. Mm -hmm. So that was that was the position that, that we took. And we analogized with the rule in Foss and Harbottle and corporate law as well to, to sort of say that, you know, that corporations make a choice. And when you incorporate, you know, you, as you were saying, the, the, the benefits and the burdens. So, you know, you mm -hmm. can't sort of like create the corporate shield uh, to protect yourself from personal consequences, business consequences, but then rely on the charter where, to say, you know, as, as a person, I'm, I'm being 
well, not discriminated against, but my, my rights, my human rights have been violated effectively. So yeah, we took the position that, uh, that, that that right should not be extended to, uh, to corporations. Right. And, and that, what, yeah. what oh, was, was the name of that, that case? What was the name of that case? Oh, it's a, it's a numbered, um, corporation. Numbered, okay. Numbered Quebec we'll, company. I can't remember offhand, but it's still on reserve. We're still waiting. Oh yeah. For, yeah. 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 So we're still waiting for a discussion. That's and, very cool. I'm sure you're going to post a link on Twitter when it's out, when the decision Absolutely. is out. Yeah, that's Absolutely. great. By the way, uh, Alyssa is on Twitter, so everybody should follow her as soon as possible. Thank you for that. Uh, how do you find uh, intervener clients? Is it very similar to uh, finding other, you know, corporate clients, uh, litigation clients, or is, is, there, is there something uh, different about it? Uh, how do I find them, you mean? Yes. How do you find intervener clients? You okay, know, so I, I have my own practice, so I'm very curious about finding clients, obvious, for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I do, I do other pro bono matters too. So I think when you get into that space, people, people start to see you doing files. Mm -hmm. um, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, uh, I think two lawyers that I know referred me that the CCLA had approached them and they were unable for whatever reason. So they referred it to me. Um, I think with the, the Babylon hearing and the CIPIC, we had approached them uh, that we were interested in participating and we thought that they had a useful perspective. So I had volunteered when I was in law school with CIPIC wow. and my colleague uh, James Plotkin, my associate, he did too. So that's, mm -hmm. we're doing another, we're on the site blocking case for them too, that's coming up at the Federal Court of Appeals. So that's a, a relationship that I've always wanted to keep going. But yeah, I mean, I think you can either find an issue that interests you and try to find a client or they'll, they'll approach you. Um, more generally speaking of pro bono though, I'm trying to think how I've got two huge pro bono files going right now, actually. One, uh, one's a charter challenge. That one was a result of another pro bono case I had done uh, involving clinical trial data. So it was in the health space. And then the, one of the profs we had worked with referred us this case we're doing now, which is a section 15 challenge involving liver transplants and the prohibition on, on alcoholics receiving livers without demonstrating six month abstinence. So I yeah, I, I think once you just get in, you get into that space, right. you start getting more, more referrals. But I mean, that's for me too, I've been kind of trying to build a public law practice, you know, at a mm -hmm. small firm that when we started, didn't have a huge name uh, recognition. So I mean, pro bono work is how I give back to the community. I volunteer as well, but pro bono has always been very important to me, but it, it also benefits my public law practice because That's you know, right. you're out there, you're getting judgments, people are able to see you. I have one, I, I don't know if I can, I shouldn't say it yet because it's not public, the mandate, but it's a case where I was speaking about one of my pro bono files at a conference and then the paying client saw me there presenting and uh, is now paying me in a very interesting public law matter. So I think it's, it's like everything else. I mean, my approach to getting clients, come back to sort of your question about getting clients has always been sort of do good work and the rest will follow. Like I've, I've gotten a lot of referrals from opposing counsel on files, sometimes when you're you know, allied with another party and they, they see your work. But that for me has always been more of my approach. I've not been one of those lawyers who's taking clients to golf tournaments or whatnot. I, I actually enjoy golf and I don't mind golfing. And soccer. Yeah, soccer is my, my main sport. But uh, in terms of, you know, how to build business, for me, it's always just been through doing work. Right. And speaking at conferences and stuff too, 
but just putting myself out there so people can see my work and that that has seemed to work yes and uh, as litigators our work is or can be very very public Re the reported decisions right so i mean until you have a reported decision now you're really a litigator i remember my first reported decision i was like yay yeah <laughs> now i'm a litigator <laughs> Three years, I think, after I was called to the bar or something like that. It takes a while till they get through the system, you know, but I, I agree know. when I, when another lawyer, when I get a new file and I see the lawyer on the other side, the first thing I do is check Canley to see how many reported decisions they have. Cause I want to see, is this somebody who goes to court or not? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Or also you uh, check what judges say about that lawyer. Sometimes they do say things, right? Correct. So uh, having a Supreme Court of Canada clerk uh, in a firm and then also uh, doing public law litigation are the two markers of a blue blood elite <laughs> litigation uh, firm, I would say, right? And uh, I'm, I'm really not being facetious or anything like that. I think it's really important to know uh, which litigators are elite litigators. I, why? Because they set the standard. We all, we all want to know which athletes are elite athletes, right? We don't want to know which athletes are mediocre athletes. We don't follow them, but we all want to know which litigators are elite litigators. And of course, uh, because people uh, you know, have limited time and resources, we can't do full diligence to find out who is who. So we use markers. We use certain uh, symbols that replace full diligence uh, and uh, fairly reliably so. So um, some things are really important in that respect. And, uh, you know, you, you hit both uh, Supreme Court clerk, you do public law litigation, pro bono public law litigation. Do you do anything else that uh, you would consider uh, a marker of, uh, of an elite litigator? Well, I've, for 10 years, I've coached a competitive moot. Uh, so I coached the University of Ottawa Alaskan moot team. So I, uh, for me, that's another, like, mooting for me was probably the most important experience in law school. And it's what drove me to want to do litigation. So again, that's why I choose to give back in that way. It's actually extremely time consuming to, to coach the moot. But uh, I also think it's a privilege because presumably if they're wanting me to teach future litigators, they, they mm -hmm. must think that I'm, I'm doing okay on my own. That's right. We talked a, a lot about um, good things, that things that make us feel good in litigation, but there are plenty of things that don't make us feel good, that make us feel bad and that give litigation a bad name. So I remember um, before I became a litigator, when I was still in law school, I heard stories about commercial litigation. This is the worst and when it comes to psychopaths and when it comes to uh, the amount of work, when it comes to passive aggressive techniques and things like that, right? And I really didn't find that to be true. And I don't know why, but uh, you know, I, I've never really had anyone serve me with thousands of pages on, on Friday afternoons and, you know, and things like that never really happened to me. People didn't insult me. Uh, but uh, I understand that pe different people have different experience. Have you ever had bad experiences uh, in, uh, in your work, right? And how you coped with them? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's an up and down, an up and down profession for sure. Uh, there's, so to, I'll talk about two bad things. So the first bad thing is, as you've said, nasty people. The second is getting results that you didn't expect. So a loss. And of course, I'll, I'll turn to that second, but in terms of, of dealing with opposing counsel, of course, of course it, ha it has happened with me. I will say that I'm privileged to practice in Ottawa and, and it's a relatively small bar. So, you know, you really get repeat customers. I mean, opposing counsel, not clients, hopefully not. And as a litigation boutique, it's usually a bad sign of someone veering towards vexatiousness. But no, I mean, 
it, it's so you're going to end up against the same people over and over. Like I, I've hit the same opposing council in Ottawa often more than once in my career and I'm 11 years in, 12 years in. So, you know, it's all the more important I find in Ottawa to be very civil and we have that reputation as I understand it. Uh, I have, you know, you get it occasionally. Um, I have, you know, where opposing counsel will make ad hominem remarks or personal remarks. And that I think that I'm able to put aside actually. It, it, in the moment, it's very hard, but mm. as soon as you show them, it doesn't bother you. I find, you know, I remember one time in court, a, a guy was very mean to me, but as soon as it ended, I pretended it hadn't bothered me at all, even though I wanted to cry inside and uh, just was very professional and, you know, didn't mm. make a big deal. Um, I have at times, I have experienced sexist comments and those ones I will push back on and say, you know, that that's sexist. Would you have said that to a man or something like that? But by and large, you know, I'm not someone who engages in extensive letter writing wars or, you know, I, I did one recently where somebody wrote me a very long letter and I just, you know, wrote like, you know, we disagree. We believe all of your case law can just be distinguished. We have instructions to accept any service of any proceeding you might commence done you know like it's yeah. to me I, I just have not seen these you know lengthy emails or letter wars result in any kind of productive discussion I, I have had productive discussions over the phone I think rather than you know you, of course sometimes you have to write a demand letter setting out your position but when you're getting really back and forth I think it's better to pick up the phone and call someone and try to figure out what's actually going on because one thing I've learned is you know, that very rarely is a dispute entirely one-sided. Like often what my client tells me the first time is not exactly what happened. And it's not, you know, it's not saying the sky was blue when it was red. It's more like little glossing over of things that, you know, they want to present their story in the best way. And I think that's where it's often helpful to figure out as soon as possible, well, like, What's, what's motivating the other side? You know, what's actually going on here? What, what's their position on what happened? And sometimes that helps us, you know, get into the same ballpark uh, sooner. So yeah, in terms of unpleasantness, I mean, it, it happens. I think people, people are tired, they're emotional. Sometimes they overreact. So I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. Now, what I have found I, you know, last summer, there was a stretch where I lost two trials in, in a row, got the decisions within a month. And in one case, I had, you know, really gone all in. Uh, I had dealt with opposing counsel who was abusive. And, you know, I had given my clients a really strong opinion. But the judge went and changed the law, which she's entitled to do. And the common law can change incrementally and we're appealing. So we'll see if the court of appeal likes her change. But that I found, you know, I asked for 15 defendants. It's the limitations issue I was referring to before. And, you know, as soon as you send them the decision, they all start calling and yelling at you. And, you know, that I think that was a very, and the judge, you know, you talk about Friday afternoon, it was, it was the Friday before Labor Day weekend and the judge dropped this decision at 4 p.m. on the Friday. And I had to send it immediately to my clients. Obviously that's our obligation, but you know, it made for a very depressing weekend. And that, you know, that kind of thing where you've given a strong opinion and it doesn't work out and you, you can't help but question what have you done? And I think you have to give yourself time to reflect. You know, I've had hearings, um, you know, I got dismissed from the bench one time in divisional court and you have, you give yourself that time to think, you know, did I do something wrong? Cause sometimes, you know, you're, it's a learning experience. It's the practice of law. Uh, even if you find you maybe could have done something better, you have to give yourself time to think about what you did how you might do it better next time. But 
at a certain point you do need to move on. And that's where we talk about resilience. And that's something that personally for me, uh, I attribute a lot to having played competitive sports and having experienced a lot of failure, <laughs> losses in sports competitions, you know, uh, my ringette team made the national final and I didn't get to play, sat on the bench the whole game, you know, when I was 15 and at the time it was heartbreaking, but you know, the next year I, I trained really hard all summer and came back stronger. So, and it doesn't, it doesn't need to be sports. Again, when we, like I said, we like to hire clerks. We also like to, to hire people that have had experience with failure. And it's not necessarily sports. It can be music. It can be drama. But like, I find that if people haven't failed, when something goes wrong, and uh, you've got so many balls in the air as a litigator, you're, you're gonna mess up, you know, mm -hmm. um, you've got to be able to bounce back really quickly and just put your mind to fixing the problem. And, you know, that's now happened and that's now what you have to deal with. So you've got to, you know, move forward, fix that problem if you can, if not incorporate it into your theory of the case or your strategy going forward. Wow, wow. What can I say? Um, your partners and associates are really lucky to have you. Uh, and uh, thank you for your frankness and for for the insights. I uh, I wish I worked with someone like you and you know had a chance to speak with with someone like you more often than you know an occasional YouTube interview. Uh, this is really interesting, really uh, moving stuff, and I think we need more litigators tell their stories and talk about this. I really appreciate it uh, that you. Uh, found time in your busy schedule to talk to our viewers today. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I personally never uh, spoke with you before other than on Twitter. And, you know, yeah. I hope, uh, you know, this is another reason for me to go to Ottawa and maybe uh, I'll be able to take you out for coffee uh, when I'm there Absolutely. after COVID. <laughs> yeah, anytime. Uh, it was lovely to finally meet you sort of in person because, yes, we've had exchanges on on Twitter, but uh, never in person or, well, yes. so I could see you, how's that? <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Well, this is the new reality. This is the new in-person, <laughs> Zoom. Anyway, yes. so thank you so much, Alyssa. Goodbye to our viewers. And uh, I'll post, post the links uh, in the show notes. Thank you again, all the best.